Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Astara and Lily's not in here. And as always, I'd like to remind you to please stay safe and healthy and hit that like button, subscribe, comment below, and hit the notification bell. And today we are going to get into back into the infinity and the mind. The science and philosophy of the infinite by Rudy Rucker. I didn't think of the name of it yesterday, but here we go. And we are on well, chapter one, but we are in here a little ways. Anyway, it was George Cantor who, in the late 1800s, finally created a theory of the actual infinite, which, by its apparent consistency, demolished the Aristotelian and scholastic proofs that no such theory could be found. Although Cantor was a thoroughgoing scholar who later wrote some very interesting philo philosophical defenses of the actual infinite, his point of entry was a mathematical problem having to do with the uniqueness of the representation of a function as a trigonom trigon trigonometric series. To give the flavor of the type of construction Cantor was working with, let us consider the construction of the Koch curve shown in figure 4. The Koch curve is found as the limit of an infinite sequence of approximations. The first approximation is a straight line segment, stage zero. <coughs> the, the middle third of the segment is then replaced by two pieces, each as long as the middle third, who are joined like two sides of an equilateral triangle, stage one. I'll show you. Them. Those are the ones that it's talking about. Okay. At each succeeding stage, each line segment has its middle third replaced by a spike resembling of an equilateral, equilateral triangle. Now, if we take inf infinity as something that can, in some cases, be attained, then we will regard the limit of this infinite process as being a curve actually existing, if not in physical space, then at least in a mathematical object. The curve, the Koch curve is discussed at length in Benoit Mandelbrot's book, Fractals, where he explains, hey, Jamie, Jamie came up to be with us today, where he explains why there is a reason to think of the Koch curve and this infinite sp uh, spikiness as being a better model of a coastline than of its infinitely spiky approximations. Cantor soon obtained, hey, sweetheart, and obtained a number of interesting results about actually infinite sets, most notably the result that the set of points on the real <laughs> line constitutes a higher infinitely th infinity than the set of all natural numbers. That is, Cantor was able to show that infinity is not an all-or-nothing concept. There are degrees of infinity. This fact runs counter to the naive concept of infinity. There is only one infinity, and this infinity is unattainable and not quite real. She really wants to be with me today. She's been following me. Cantor keeps this naive infinity, which he tells the absolute infinity, but he allows for many intermediate levels between the infinite and the absolute infinite. His intermediate stages corresponded to the, his transfinite numbers, numbers that are inf that are infinite but nonetheless conceivable. In the next section we will in the next section we will discuss the possibility of finding physically existing transfinite net sets. We will then look for ways in which such actual infinities might exist mentally. Finally we will discuss the absolute or metaphysical infinite. This threefold division is due to Cantor who in the fo following pay passage dis distinguishes between the absolute finite infinite the physical infini infinities and the mathematical infinities. The actual infinite rises in three contexts. First, when it is realized in the most absolute, in the most complete form, in a fully independent, otherworldly being. In Dio, where I call it the absolute infinite or simply absolute, second, when it occurs in the contingent created world. Third, when the mind grasps in an abstracto as a mathematical magnitude number or order type. 
I wish to make a sharp contrast between the absolute and what I call the transfinite, that is, the actual infinities of the last two sorts, which are clearly limited, subject to further increase, and thus related to the finite. Physical infinities. There are three ways in which our world appears to be unbounded and thus perhaps infinite. It seems that time cannot end, at least in the universe. It seems that space cannot end, and it seems that any interval of space or time can be divided and subdivided endlessly. We will consider three sneeze here. These three apparent physical infinities in three sub subsections. Temporal infinities. Suppose that the human race was never going to die out. Does any gen given generation be followed by another generation? Would we not then have to admit that the number of generations of man is actually infinite? <coughs> Aristotle agreed, argued, excuse me, against this conclusion. Well, I can see why. Asserting that in this situation, the number of generations of man would be but potentially infinite, that is, infinite only in the sense of being in inexhaustible. He maintained that any given time there would only have been some finite number of generations and that it was not permissible to take the <laughs> entire future as a single whole containing an actual finite, infinite, actual infinitude of generations. Okay, and this is showing a little bigger there. It is my opinion that this sort of distinction rests on a view of time that has been fairly well discredited by modern rel relativistic physics in order to agree with Aristotle that although there will never be a last generation, there is no infinite set of all the generations because the world can come to a human entity can come to an end, but it could be infinity, infinite if they didn't. We must believe that the future does not exist as a stable, definite thing. For if we have the future existing in a fixed way, then we have all the infinitely many future generations existing at once. But one of the chief consequences of Einstein's special theory of relativity is that it is space-time that is fundamental, not isolated space which evolves at time, times past. I will not argue this point in detail here, but let my, me repeat that on the basis of modern physical theory, we have every reason to think of the passage of time as an illusion. Past, present, and future all exist together in space-time. So the question of the infinitude of time is not one time, one that is to be dodged by denying that time can be treated as a fixed dimension such as space. The question still remains, is time infinite? If we take the, <coughs> the entire space-time of our universe, is, time, is the time dimension infinite? infinitely extended or not. Fifty or even twenty years ago it would have been natural to assert that our universe has no beginning or end and that time is thus infinite in both directions but recently it has become an established fact that the universe does have a beginning in a time known as the Big Bang. I mean it's a matter of opinion. But we all, of course there was probably some sort of a bang but that doesn't mean there isn't a God. The Big Bang took place approximately 15 billion years ago. At that time, our universe was the size of a point. It has been expanding ever since. Since What happened before the Big Bang is that it is at least possible to answer nothing. The apparent par paradox of having the first instant in time is sometimes avoided by saying that the Big Bang did not occur in time, that time is open rather than closed in the past. This is a subtle distinction, but a useful one. We think of time as being all the points greater than or equal to zero, then there is a first instant zero. But if we think of time as being all the points strictly greater than zero, then there is no first in in instant. For any instant t greater than zero, no one has an earlier instant t2 that is also greater than zero. And I'll show you that one on this side here. But in, my but in any case, if we think of time as not existing before the Big Bang, then there are certainly not, not an infinite number of years in our past. And what about the future? There's no real consensus on this. Many cos cosmologists feel that our universe will eventually stop expanding and collapse to form a single huge black hole called the Big Stop or the Nab-Gib. 
Others feel that the expansion of the universe will continue indefinitely. That the universe really does start as a point and eventually contract to a point. It, is it really reasonable to say that there is no time except for the interval between these points? What comes before the beginning and after the end? And here's the that one the genocide. One response is to view the universe as an oscillating system, which repeatedly goes through expansions and contractions. This would re reintroduce an infinite time, which could, however, be avoided. The way in which one would avoid infinite time in an end endlessly oscillating universe would be to adopt a belief in what used to be called the eternal return. This is the belief that every so often the universe must repeat itself. This idea is that it, that a finite universe must return to the same state every so often, and once the same state has risen, the future evolution of the universe will be the same as the one already undergone. Okay, so yeah, um, I'll show you these, and we'll get down to the next there, here, okay. The, the doctrine of eternal occurrence amounts to the assumption that <clears throat> time is a vast circle. An oscillating universe with circular time is pictured in figure 10. There is a simple model of an oscillating universe with circular time, which can be called toroidal space-time. In toroidal space-time, we have an oscillating universe that repeats itself after every cycle. Such a model is obtainable by identifying the two points, Big Bang and Big Stop in figure 11. I don't know if she... Okay, okay it's in this page. Well, maybe it is on this page. Um, okay, figure 11 is down here. Okay, I just showed you there. Note, however, that if the universe really expands forever, that it, then it cannot ever repeat itself, as the average distance between galaxies is a continually increasing quantity that never returns to the same value. Spatial infinities. We now turn to a consideration of the possibility of spatial infinities. The potential versus the actual, actual infinity distinction is sometimes used to try to scotch this question at the outset. Immanuel Kant, for an instance, argues that the world cannot be an infinite whole of ex coexistent things because in order, there, therefore, to conceive the world which fits all spaces of whole, whole, the successive synthesis of the parts of an infinite world would have to be looked upon as a completed, as completed, that is, an infinite time would have to be looked upon as elapsed during the enumeration of all coexisting things. Remember where I started so I can Okay, yeah, I was on yeah, okay. Can't put Kant's put point is that space is some is in some sense not already a real reality there. That things exist together in space only when a mind perceives them to do so. If we accept this, then it is true that an infinite space is something that no finite mind can know of after infinite after a finite amount of time, but one feels that the world does exist as a whole. In advance of any efforts on our part to see it as a finite a, as a unity. And if we take all of space time, it certainly does not seem to be meaningless to ask whether the spatial uh, extent of space time is infinite or not. In De Ruum Natura, Lucretius first ga gave this classic argument for the unbound unboundedness of space. Suppose for a moment that the <clears throat> that the whole of space was bounded with and that someone made his way to it, its utter, uttermost boundary and threw a flying d dart. It seems that either the dart must go past the boundary in which case it is no boundary of space or the dart must stop in which case there is something just beyond the boundary that stops it which again means that the purported boundary is not really the end of the universe. So great was their revulsion against the apparent that Parmenides, Plato, and Aristotle all held that the space of our universe is bounded infinite, infinite. 
having the form of a vast sphere. When faced with the question of what lies outside the sphere, Aristotle maintained that what is limited is not limited in reference <clears throat> to something that surrounds it. In modern times, we have actually developed a way to make Aristotle's claim a bit more reasonable. As Lucretius realized the weak point in the claim that space is a finite sphere and that such a space has a definite boundary, but there is a way to construct a three-dimensional space which is finite and which does not have boundary points. Simply take the hypersurface of a hypersphere. Such a space is endless but not finite, infinite. And we read the different things that he's... Here we go. Okay. So great was there... Okay. Okay, I already read that. Okay. To the next page. To understand how something can be endless but not infinite, think of a circle. A fly can walk around and around the rim of a glass without ever coming to a barrier stopping point. But nonetheless, he will soon retrace his steps. Again, the surface of the earth is a two-dimensional manifold, which is finite but unbounded. Unbounded in the sense of having no edges. You can travel and travel on the earth's surface without ever coming to any truly impassable barrier. But if you continue long enough, you'll begin to recross your steps. The reason that the two-dimensional... Where am I? The reason that the two-dimensional surface of the Earth is finite but unbounded is that it is spent in three-dimensional space into the shape of a sphere. In the same way, it is possible to reimagine the three-dimensional space of our universe at being, as being bent in some four-dimensional space into the shape of a hypersphere. It was Bernard Ryman who first realized this possibility in 1854. There is, however, a traditional belief that anticipates the hypersphere. This tradition is described in, in the essay, The Fearful Sphere of Pascal, by George Lewis Bur Borges, is summarized by the saying, attributed to the legendary magician Hermes Trismegistus, that God is an intelligible sphere, whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is everywhere. If the universe is indeed a hypersphere, then it would be quite accurate to regard it as a sphere whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. To see why this is so, con so consider the fact that if space is hyperspherical, then one cannot can cover all of space by start starting at any point and letting a sphere expand toward outward from that point. The curious thing is that if one lets a sphere expand in hyperspherical space, there comes a point when the circumference of the sp sphere turns into a point and disappears. This fact can be grasped by, consider by considering the analogous situation of the sequence of circular latitude lines on the spherical surface of the surf Earth. This line of thoughts appears in Dante's Paradiso in 1300. Aristotle had believed that the world was a series of nine spheres centered around the Earth. Okay, the last of these crystalline spheres was called the premium, premium mobile and lay beyond the sphere upon which were fastened all, all of the stars <coughs> other than the sun, which was attached to the fourth sphere. And the Paradiso Dante is led out through space by Beatrice. It passes each of the nine spheres of the world, moon, Ver Mercury, <coughs> Venus, sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, fixed stars, premium mobile. Beyond the, these nine spheres lie nine spheres of, angel, of angels, corresponding to the nine spheres of the world. Beyond the nine spheres of angels lies a point called the Empyron, which is the abode of God. The puzzling thing about Dante, cos, Dante's cosmos as it is drawn in figure 14. I'll show you that. Here's figure 14 right there. Okay. is that here the Emerin appears not to be a point, but rather to be all the space, except for the interior of the last sphere of angels. But this can be remedied if we take space to be hyperspherical. In figure 15, and that'll be the next page. I'll show you that. Hold on. Figure 15 there. I'll show you that afterwards. 
I have drawn the model we obtain if we take the diagram on the last page and curve it up into a sphere with a point-sized empyron. In the same way, the three-dimensional model depicted by the first picture can be turned into the infinite unbounded space of the second picture if we bend our three-dimensional space in such a way that all of the space outside our last angelic sphere is compressed to a point. Figure 16, and I'll show you that, is Doré's engraving of the Empyrean surrounded by its spheres of angels. This is figure 16 from Gustav's Doré's Divine Comedy right there. One day I'll read Dante's Divine Comedy on the channel. I gotta, buy, I gotta get the book. I have a real picture book that's not like a full book. This whole notion of hyperspherical space was not consciously developed until the mid-19th century. In the mid-ages, there was a general and uncritical acceptance of Aristotle's view of the universe without Dante's angelic spheres. Lucretius, of course, had insisted that space is infinite, and there was many other thinkers, such as Nicholas of Cusa and Giordano Bruno, who believed in the infinitude of space. Some kept to the Aristotelian world system, but suggested that there were many such setups drifting around. Others opted for a looser setup, under which stars and planets are more or less randomly mixed together in an infinite space. Bruno strongly advocated such viewpoints in his writings, especially his dialogue of 1584 on the infinite universe and worlds. Bruno traveled freely around Europe during his lifetime, teaching his doctrine of the infinite universe at many centers of learning. In 1591, a wealthy Venetian persuaded Bruno to come from Frankfurt to teach him the art of memory and invention. Shortly after Bruno arrived, the trap was sprung. His host had been working closely with the ecclesiastical authorities who considered Bruno a, le a leading heretic or heresiarch. Bruno was turned over to the Inquisition. For nine years, Bruno was interrogated, tortured, and tried, but he would not give up his beliefs. Not good for him. Early in 1600, he was burned at the stake in the Roman Piazza Campo di Fiori. Bruno's example called, caused Galileo to express himself a good deal more cautiously on scientific questions in which the church had an interest. Yeah, because back then they used to really, really... Uh, um, they would, well, I can't even do the word. I'm just escaping my mind. Back then they used to... Oh, forget it. I'm on the blank. <laughs> okay. Here, where am I? Oh, goodness gravy. I just lost my... Lucretius, of course, had insisted that spheres is infinite and that there were... Okay, I'm down here. In 1591, a wealthy Venetian persuaded Bruno to come from Frankfurt to teach him the art of memory and invention. Shortly after Bruno arrived, the trap was sprung. Hey, hold on. I'm using my... Oh, okay, I was on the other page. What am I doing? Okay, yeah, sorry. Excuse <coughs> me. <coughs> <coughs> okay. Whether or not our space is actually infinite is a question that could uh, conceivably resolve in the next few decades, assuming that Einstein's theory of gravitation is correct. There are basically two types of universe. A hyperspherical closed and unbounded space that expands and then and then contracts back to a point. An infinite space that expands forever. It is my guess that case will come to be most widely accepted. If only because the notion of an actually infinite space extending out in every direction is so unsettling. Fate of the universe in case in case is certainly more interesting since, uh, since such a universe collapses back to an infinitely dense space-time singularity that may serve as a seed for a whole new universe. In case 
Two, on the other hand, we simply have cooling and dying suns drifting further and further apart. In an utterly empty black, immense, uh, excuse me, black immensity, and in the end, there are only ashes and cinders in absolute eternal night. Let me show you that. I don't know if I already did. I don't know. I'm getting a little been home too long. <laughs> Even though I am basically pro infinity, my emotions lie with the hyperspherical space. But is there any way of finding a Spatial infinity here? Well, what about the four-dimensional space, which a hyperspherical universe is floating? Many would dismiss this space as a mere mathematical fiction, as a colorful way of expressing the finite, but unbounded nature of our universe. This widely held position is really a more sophisticated version of Aristotle's claim that what is limited need not be limited with reference to something outside itself. But what if one chooses to believe that the four-dimensional space in which our universe curves is real? We might imagine a higher 4D, four-dimensional world called, let us say, a dualverse. The dualverse would be a 4D space in which a number of hyperspheres were floating. The hypersphere of each of the hyperspheres would be a finite, unbounded 3D universe. Thus, a dualverse would contain a number of 3D universes, but no inhabitants of any of these Universes could reach any one of the others unless he could somehow travel through 4D space by lowering all the dimensional by one. One can see that this situation is analogs to a universe that is a 3D space, 3D space in which a number of spheres are floating. The surface of each sphere are, or planet is a finite, unbounded 2D space, and no one can get from one planet's surface to another planet surface without traveling throughout 3D, 3D space. Following the hermetic principle as above, so below, one is, attempted, one is tempted to believe that the dual verse we are in is actually a finite and unbounded 4D space. The 4D surface of a 5D sphere is 5D space, and that there are never such dual verses drifting about in a 5D unit triverse. This could be continued indefinitely. One is reminded of these eastern descriptions of the world as a disc resting on the backs of elephants. That's hilarious. Who stand upon a turtle, who stands upon a turtle, who stands upon a turtle, who stands upon a turtle, etc. Note that in that particular sort of cosmos, there's only one universe, one dualverse, one triverse, and so on. But in the kind of an infinitely regressing Cosmos that I've drawn in figure 18, and there's figure 18 that he drew. We have infinitely many objects of, at each level. Note also that to get from star A to B, star B, one would have to move through 5D space to get to a different dualverse. It is a curious feature of such a cosmos that although there are an infinite number of stars, no one in dimensional space has more than a, a finite number of them. I think I'm going to stop right there. Get a little interesting reading. Food for thought. But if you enjoyed this video, Please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, hit that notification bell. And always stay safe and healthy and stay tuned for more from Astara. And here's Jamie and Lily. Have a good day.